I think we're starting. Are we good? Hey, everybody. Welcome to My Illegal Minds uh, and or the gibberish that rattles around. Um, my name is Michael Branson Smith. Um, I'm here to talk about what I have stolen is a quote from someone we're about to meet, uh, the illegal mind of the artist. And it's, I'm talking about it in the context of art, remix, and copyright, or the above uh, titling uh, AI gibberish above. That's how it interpreted the illegal mind of the artist as a title. Mentioned three times, and it still got it like that. So uh, this is Jerry Saltz. Uh, this is a very insider baseball human being. Uh, if you're in the art world. And I know of him, and the reason it came up, and it is his quote, in the 90s I was in art school at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and when Jerry Saltz was coming, it was like, Jerry Saltz is coming, Jerry Saltz is coming. I was like, who the hell is Jerry Saltz? And, um, you know, he showed up, and he, this, it was very compelling to me, because I was the one who was an appropriation artist, I was like, taking uh, imagery from old textbooks of, and uh, artifacts of uh, safety, which I was very interested in at the time, and iconography of uh, uh, Christianity, and um, of all things, my lifeguard safety book, handbook, and like making, taking their bathing suits off and making them look like they were naked instead of like demonstrating lifeguarding uh, positions. And he, he used this phrase, the illegal mind of the artist, and I was like, yes, right? But Jerry Saltz went on to, actually, this man is a Pulitzer Prize winning critic. And, you know, he uh, 71 now, and he didn't become a critic until he was 40. He actually was uh, a failed artist. He was uh, just kind of lost his cool about it. He was worried about imposter. He came from Chicago. He... Um, was in the art scene there, he got an NEH grant, moved to New York and kind of freaked out and went on to drive trucks for three years, four years, five years. And while he was a truck driver, he was like, I gotta get out of this terrible job. And decided it's like, I can be an art critic. I can write like those art forum types. That's cool. And he did. And he was parroting their style for quite some time until he found himself, which was I want to be, this is, I'm going to say, as I would watch Sister Wendy. If anybody knows art criticism, he, this was a nun who used to talk about uh, Renaissance art primarily, but it was very plain language and very just descriptive of the content and the framework in which it came from. And he's like, I want to be that for modern art. And he did it. And he was really successful at it. Um, but he also became really good at Twitter. And this is kind of a, a, a framing point of view. So... This, we're gonna see what this is in response to in a second. So and he's yelling at artists, artists use materials, images are materials. Every, I mean, adding the emphasis because that's what it reads like. Um, Every photographer crying when prints, and we're gonna learn who prints is, not the artist, known, artist formerly known as prints, but he comes up too. Um, totally transforms, what are their idiot images as fakes, right? All the crap, fake artists who cry, whine, and sue other artists have no idea what art is. That copyright is dead, right? And will never, and we'll die never knowing art. And he goes on and on this way. And he's like, you can use my stuff. Steal it. You can make money off of it. All bets are off, right? Sounds like crazy. This, again, Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> art critic, all right? Uh, this is in 2017. And what he was responding to was this. So Richard Prince is a very, very, very famous appropriation artist, all right? And he's been doing this for decades he took a photograph of a marble ad magazine print, right? Famous, like, you know, the horses and, like, the guy with the hat, the cowboy hat. And he sold it for millions of dollars, right? He printed it out. And he's done traditional, you know, painting and rear, but this is what he's very famous for. And this was his most recent shenanigans of... Commenting, you can see them, they're right here. Commenting, Richard Prince 64, Canal, Zion, Da, Lama, Jam, you know, ooh, uh, cloud, partly sunny? Sunny. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. And he would make these comments, he would literally screenshot it, send it to his art generator dude, or person, I don't know who it is, make a printout, and he was selling these. This is in the famous Gagosian gallery. If you're in the insider world, they're like, you know, they're the Microsoft of uh, gallery sales. 
or Google, whoever you want to call them, um, and was selling these for tens of thousands a piece. All right, and he was <coughs> felt fully licensed to do this because of this particular situation. So, in 2000, uh, a French photographer named Patrick Carew uh, published Yes Rasta, a book of dramatic black and white photographs of Rastafarians against a lush Jamaican landscape. And eight years later, um, Richard Prince debuts the Canal Zone series, all right? And so Carew, Richard Prince, all right? And there are 30 pieces, a lot more were, there were a lot more that were more collage oriented for the most part. And Carew sues him, okay? This goes to the New York uh, court. So there's, there's gonna be, you have to keep track of this. The New York court is the second uh, circuit. The LA court is the ninth circuit. Kind of keep that in the back, but it's the LA, the West Coast, East Coast divide. There's, this is going to be important later on. Um, and basically, the initial judge says total copyright infringement. Not only that, this stuff needs to be destroyed. Like literally, the, the judge says destroy that stuff, right? Second court says, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, pump the brakes. In fact, you know, this is, you know, that was just a horrible idea to say that, like to destroy the work. And they found fair use, and, thir th and this is the banana part. <coughs> 30 of the 25 are clearly fair use, but five are not clear. So they send it back down to the first court. And this is one of the <laughs> ones that was, I think, not clear. All right? All right. So the second circuit decided the case would hinge on whether the reasonable a reasonable observer would find Prince's work to have been transformative, and transformative is this very important word here as part of the fair use argument of copyright. Oh my gosh, I have uh, messages. Hi, B. <laughs> Let me see if I can mute that. Oh, where's the cursor? Oh well, we can all live with my daughter, right? Jumping here. Yeah. Oh, it didn't. That's right. It's second. Oh, maybe I'll just. Oh, I can't mute anyway. All right. Well, let's not worry about it. Um, and so, you know, in particular, you know, if the quoted matter, and this is um, from the Second Circuit, if the quoted matter is used as raw material, right? And so that's, that's the quote from, we heard uh, Jerry Salt saying, raw material, right? Um, transformed in creation of new uh, information, new aesthetics, new insights and understandings. This is the very type of activity that fair use doctrine intends to protect for the enrichment of society. So raw material, Society needs that appropriation and remix to happen. But these two photographers sued. Now, we're back in 2017. So we, we went backwards. So just, just to keep uh, a frame, this, this was way back in uh, 2013, the decision. The initial show was like 2009, decision 2013. We're back now in 2017. All right, actually now. This is pretty much, this, this is an ongoing case. And what's interesting is, so these two photographers, uh, Donald Graham, um, who is the photographer of the Rastafarian smoking a joint, and Eric McNault, who is the photographer, and that's actually uh, uh, Kim Gordon, who's Sonic Youth, all right? So this is, he's using famous people off, often in his imagery, and, and but this one was interesting. So Prince immediately says, I need a summary judgment. This must be fair use. And that judge is like, wait a minute here. So, you know, this is, we're in, we're in New York still, all right? You know, elucid, this is the judge's description. It's like elucidating the boundaries uh, between technology and art blend. No, that's not it. This is it. Um, You know, Prince can, did not use the plaintiff's photographs as raw material to create a collage, or nor did he attempt to obscure the images, right? And so he's talking about the reasonable observers coming up again. It's like, this one is like, nah, not fair use, not sure yet. And so this one is now ongoing. So he tried to get it, and it's a whole process. Like, you can just say, hey, let's get this tossed, right? Let's immediately get this tossed. So another Prince. This one you may have heard of, actually, because this was the Supreme Court got involved, right? So the Supreme Court just um, cited that the use of the licensing of this image on the memorial 
um, publication in Condé Nast, because you know, instead of, uh, uh, was not fair use. And this is important because of a couple things. So the original photographer, uh, oh gosh, I apologize. What's her name? I can't read. Oh, wait, it's there. Yeah, Lynn Goldsmith. Sorry, I apologize. So Lynn Goldsmith, so this dates back to actually this. So Lynn Goldsmith created this photograph on the left. And way back in uh, 1981, uh, it was licensed for 1984. This is like Prince, like in the beginnings, like he's becoming a thing. So in 1984, Vanity Fair licenses the image from Lynn Goldsmith to give to Andy Warhol to create this portrait. And not only that, just series of portraits, which she didn't agree to, but this entire series of portraits, all right? And so that was the original usage, okay? We go back to uh, basically, this is 2017 when Prince dies, he, he accidentally o overdoses. Condé Nast doesn't go back to Lee Goldsmith. They go back directly to uh, Andy Warhol's foundation and say, hey, we want to use one of those, a different one, one of, a different one, right? It's not the same one, no purple face, just an orange face. That's important. And so this happens, and what's interesting is they knew it was going to be a problem, and the Warhol Foundation proactively sues Lynn Goldsmith and say, ah, we know this is fair use, don't you stop us. But didn't go how imagined. This goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. This is Sotomayor's analysis. For Sotomayor, the only relevant feature was Warhol's use is that the commercial licensing of the image. Prints of Warhol made of gold, the goldsmith's image, which have been displayed widely in mu uh, museums since their creation in the 90s, and the opinion offers little or no reason that those aren't unfair. So basically, those artworks that are hanging in museums, they're cool. What was interesting about this is it was a very narrow description. It's saying like, because they tried to use it in basically as a substitute in the commercial market. This is part of the fair use law. I'm not gonna go through those. There's like the forced parts of fair use to look through. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Ask me anything, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> um, but the idea was she was most interested and it's like, hey, it was a swap. Like it's, it's like, it, we have the history of like, this was used for a very specific commercial use. And this is gonna come up again as what might be happening in the future in the context of social media. And we're about to jump into social media and where we are. So this is like this kind of his, history lesson through the, uh, the arts because we have a different prince. Another prince, let me see if I can, where's the cursor? Here it is. Oh, it's on here. Are you taking the music? Where's the cursor? Let's see if we can get the, there we go. How do we turn the volume up? There it is. Okay, so Stephanie Lenz, very important character in this, this story. She takes a video of her child in the kitchen, as we just saw, dancing the let's go crazy, you know? Um, universal music, all right, sues her, all right? And to, no, no, doesn't sue her. Does a takedown? Just a classic YouTube takedown. We're all used to this. And under the DMCA, and so the DMCA is now like that 1998 law is now getting involved. All right. And she uh, sues her for doing what's um, the party, UMC, knowingly materially misrepresents a takedown request as liable um, and then can be liable for damages if this is the case. Like, so she's saying, like, this is ridiculous. This is total fair use. This is, you know, this is malicious. And so we're like, yeah, go for it, Lens. And so let's see if we got to get to. There we go. So there's two things that come out of this that are really, really important. 
this judge for the first time, and, um, and this is the Ninth Circuit, so now we're on the West Coast. This is the West Coast argument, all right? The Ninth Circuit judge says, hey, because fair use constituted, uh, 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 because fair use, wait, 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 wait. Oh, this, this judge held that because fair use constituted an, a, a, a use authorized by law, and this is because of the DMCA really says this, like the idea that fair use is authorized by law. Because historically, fair use was a defense argument, right? Like the idea is, I do something, I, I use stuff, materials, which I've done a lot, and you're going to see some funny examples, hopefully you enjoy them. Um, and they say like, that's my copyright, you can't do that. It's like, fair use, woohoo, no, no, you can't do that. So it's a defense, it's supposed to be a defense. But this just says, no, 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 you have to assume there might be fair use. So it's, it's, and that was a steer. But the idea with the other thing he said, this is the real problem. The, the rights holder, they only need subjectively review the material to see if it's infringing, rather than objectively. Meaning like they just get to say it's like, it's probably not fair use. And so I'm gonna say everything's not fair use. They don't have to really go through the four steps. They don't have to objectively look at those four steps. They don't, it's like, nah, just if you think it's probably not fair use, you're cool. And so that's the real sticking point that we're now living with. So she gets away with it, but. But it no screws piece. all of us, <laughs> right? And so this is something I've dealt with. This is one of the, a piece that I've like got a copyright show. So, it, you know, people that have seen some things that I do, it's like I do lots of remix. This is a mashup of the moment I lost control. This is every Bruce Banner, you know, eyeballs moment. Like, that was the best part of, like, Bruce Banner. He would be, like, being, like, physically abused or tortured or just, like, somehow, like, getting so angry, he'd suddenly, like, cower and he'd go, you know, and he'd have, like, the contact lenses on, right? And so, and, you know, I'm gonna show you a portion of it, and there's, like, literally, like, 40 of them. It's awesome, right? And so it was a, a super cut of sorts, right? And it existed for a long time, and it had 90,000 views. So it actually existed. And this is the, one of the things about Content ID, is it's, it's not just when you upload content. It's forever checking. That database of my stuff is forever being updated and changed, right? And so this is what it is now. I got a copyright strike, you know, because you know, Jim and I actually, I asked him about this, this idea. It's like, is it worth it? Because it goes through a bunch of layers. So you get to like, I, I submitted my dispute and they're like, nah. And then you're like, do you want to, are you sure? You, and this is the thing that they talk about. Are you sure you want to dispute? Because now a, an official DM, DMCA takedown notices. And the first stuff is not legal. It's all content ID. Now it's a real takedown. Now you're working with the law. And it is, they treated it, it is a legal defense. The only thing, and this is what, you know, he said, fair use can only be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. And it is your responsibility to defend yourself in a court of law. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Right, so the sad thing is, no one gets to see any of this. Right? We'll jump ahead because it kind of gets better. <laughs> All right, so we'll stop. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of funny. So I, this isn't the only one. That's the only one where I just like lost, lost. That's not the only option of the copyright holder. They can say, take it down, take it down, take it down. They can have, they have two other options, all right? Another option they can choose to say, yeah, leave it up. I just want to see what kind of views it gets. I get to see all the data, right? That's in the back end. I, I, that could be cool for me to know how to make sales or just understand is there still a market for this intellectual piece of property? But the other one, which, I don't, it does, I don't have to interact with, I get all of the ads, yep. right? I get all the sales of ads against this, right? And so here are two almost the same, one's named Batman and Louise, the other one, if I could just, uh, if I could just reach my utility belt, these are both uh, remixes. I'm gonna play the one on the right. The one on the left uh, 
was more of a straight use of the, the video uh, from the, the Super Friends uh, episode. The right one involved me doing a, a much more uh, editing of the, of, to make sure the, the lips matched. And you'll see what I mean when you watch it. Um. So, interestingly enough, that one did not get a, a, any copyright claims at all. Hmm. The one on the left, where I had done, and the, 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 the face is, because, you know, Robin just goes, blah, 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 blah. Batman's like, uh huh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay. And so you just see Robin yammering along, but the, the voice doesn't match, so I re edit it. But this one got a copyright strike. I mean, it was like, uh, well, okay, right? And this is, this is, this theme continues. Whoops. This is like fording. Go away. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is another one. I'm going to skip over this for time. Um, but this, was, this is Cops and Cowl. This is a bunch of, like, you know, this is the audio of Simon Cowell doing it, his, one of his classic takedowns of an, on America Idol, someone that never should have been. You know, Oh, uh, wait, there we go. But, so there are professional, you know, content creators out there, right? And the, uh, the EFF did this wonderful white paper, right, on what it's like to deal with content ID and interviewed three content creators who make their livings off, off of, you know, producing content for YouTube. And they talked about it, it's like, by creating a private system that dead ends in the DMCA if disputed YouTube has leveraged fear, and it's true, of uh, the law to discourage video creators from challenging content ID. You know, and it's like YouTube sells content ID to the entertainment industry as a way of making money off of others' transformative works and that YouTube discourages disputes so it can keep paying large rights holders. This is a quote from one of the creators. And you know, uh, the, Ellis is, uh, her name is Lindsay Ellis and she's a video essayist that works for the New York Times. And um, you know she's all, she has like an um, author of books and has a million you know YouTube viewers, and her producer was describing, um, or it's else I don't know exactly. She had to be, become a fair use unexpert because it was never about fair use, and it's about beating content ID. So you had creators that would constantly adjust and, and still do edit their videos to try to pass through content ID because they're so terrified of the three copyright strikes. All your shit's deleted by, like Jim Croom did. Yeah. He let it all die. Um, and so this is what's going on, you know. Um, but maybe there's hope, right? There's an Amer and I don't know if this is a good thing. And so this is the one of the stories. So there's an American composer, or I don't know. No, she's a composer. Maria Schre Schneider is presently suing uh, YouTube because of an accident. Oh, gosh, we have three minutes. I'm screwed. Um, 
lack of access to YouTube uh, content ID. So there's only about a few dozen people that are, uh, 9,000 people are allowed access to YouTube uh, content ID. And we're going to have to skip the game of fair use, um, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> or we could play the game of fair use. We could end on talking about the game of fair use. Do you want to play the game of fair use? We'll do this quickly. We'll go through this. All, of this. all right, ready? Uh, fair use or not, tattoo artist uses a photograph as a reference. Fair use or not? Fair use or mixed? Fair, it's yes, because it's a new medium. Fair use, new medium. Not fair use. We have, this is not, this isn't still ongoing in the courts, but the initial decision is not fair use. So this man's body is in jeopardy. Please remove it, take it down. Uh, uh, a re we'll skip that one. Um, social media post basically re being reposted, uh, so article from the New York Times, photographer did this art, uh, photo of this man for the New York Post. Person does a comment, of the, uh, a story about the backlash this nice guy got. Uh, for his opinions and reposted it. Fair use or not of making a, a clip of this headline and photo. Fair use. For commentary. Yeah. commentary. It was. That was fair use. Good job. Uh, not fair use. <laughs> this one's good. Uh, famous model uh, has a paparazzi taker photo. It's on the paparazzi social media. She or no, on an article somewhere, whatever. It doesn't matter. She reposts it for 24 hours, so it auto deletes and puts mood forever. Fair use or not. No, it turned out to be, this one's crazy. What's this guy's name? Um, Randy Orton has these tattoos um, on his arms, big time tattoo artist, licenses images for a video game company, tattoo artist sues because he's not getting paid for the original artwork. Fair use or not? No, it's not. It's not, that's crazy. So. But the idea is like, it's his body. but it's his body, yeah. right? And is there an implicit license when someone draws on you that it's now like you can present it any context you want? No, I mean, there's not one with wedding photographers. We're also taking pictures. I mean, they're, they're well, I'm just, I'm just saying this one's not, and it's ongoing. This one's an open conversation. This one's my favorite. Um, <laughs> Artist of no, completely unknown, uh, makes Joe Munford in 2000 makes banana and orange, registers it with the copyright artist, but uh, Maurizio Catalan introduces his artwork in the comedian. Fair use or not? No. Right now, no, but it's crazy. But this is the one that's important, okay? So this is, this is back to the ninth and second uh, circuit courts. So this is the one where, this is I think where we're kind of headed uh, Newsweek embeds a photo of someone, so embeds a social media post, technically. Just I'm embedding, embedding a social media post. What's wrong with that? I'm a professional photographer and I had this image and you could have called me and paid me some money. No, no, no. The server law, which we're kind of not getting to really quickly because um, we're running out of time, but this is the server law. Um, when uh, 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 internet, like adult entertainment company, sued Google when they were doing all of these, thumb, making all these thumbnails and Google images when it first showed up, right? And they said, wait, that's my stuff, that you can't do that. The thumbnail, so there are two infringings, the thumbnails and then the embedding of the original, because that's technically the original hot linked, right? That's a hot link, that's what we call it, or an embed. And they said this was fair use, and this became the server law. And this is the server law is from the West Coast. This is the West Coast, right? But back here, this is the East Coast. The East Coast is starting to push back against the server law, right? Um, and let's get to their quote right here. Um, I'm going to jump to it. This is the East Coast. Rakoff said the server rule is contrary to the text and legislative history of the Copyright Act. It defines uh, to display as to show a copy of the work, not to make and then show a copy of the copyrighted work. It cannot be that the Copyright Act grants authors an exclusive right to display their work publicly only if that is public and not online. So this is kind of similar, I think, in my mind to what we saw with Richard Prince in this, like it's this use and it's very specific use. And so, I mean, we're jumping ahead because we're running out of time, but this is the intellectual property. I mean, we're out of time. You know. It's lunch now, but then uh, yeah. we're out of time. Well, if you want to keep going, <laughs> we, we can keep going. Um, so this is where I think it's going, is this 
more specific, narrow, because that's what Sotomayor was going after. It's like, what's the, perp what's the usage of the fair use? And to me, that actually might be more just, right? Uh, as we're focusing on like, hey man, this, this, is, this was licensed. Uh, at, you know, Goldsmith had this right to this image in this really narrow, specific context, and she still should, right? Because it's the exact same context. And so you might say like, this is the exact same, where is it, this one, context. Like, you're using an image that you otherwise wouldn't have and would pay a photographer to use. And that happened here with someone, this was a, a, a starving polar bear video that was used um, by all these sites that were suddenly writing articles about global warming. Right? And so with this very specific use, and so what is that gonna cause us to have happen? You know, I mean, this is another one where it's like it's commentary, so it's fine. You know, we're starting Instagram, it's like, ooh, we're gonna have subscriptions. So it might be on the companies themselves who are gonna start doing stuff, like where they're gonna say, like, it starts gonna be carve outs and paying, that's a, a guess. But the IP apocalypse in IPAD is what the, the, the Mid Journey created, which I think is awesome. IP post, Ando Domino IP, right? Whoa. <laughs> right? And that was using the intellectual property of populism. So this is a, a, a computer scientist. So there's two fronts to the IP apocalypse, if I, if I would call it. One is on the side of, is the image itself copyrightable? And the other side of the argument is, is the scraping of the data, all of the images, fair use? So those are the two intellectual property right issues. So this, this man tried to get this image that was generated by his personally built engine. He's not using mid-journey. It's like, I'm a computer scientist. I know how this stuff works. Never mind the scraping. I don't know what image uh, training data he used. And the copyright, US Copyright Office ruled, it's like, hey, it was created by an on, on autonomous machines. We cannot register this work because it lacks human authorship. Human authorship. We're going to hear that a lot. Human authorship, what does that mean, right? And so this woman, she created a comic book. It's her writing, it's her framing of all these images. She sent it to the US, uh, US um, OC. They said, cool, here's a copyright. And then it came out like, wait, all those images are, are, are AI generated. They rescinded the copyright and said, nope, your writing and the arrangement, you, that's copyrighted. The images, no. Crazy, right? And so right now, this is, um, that's their, that was the quote directly to her, but this is, the, the US Copyright Office just released um, you know, a guidance document of how to work with uh, generative AI. And it says, based on the office's understanding of generative AI toxins, users do not exercise ultimate creative control. Uh, however, such systems interpret prompts and generate material. Instead, these prompts function more like instructions to a commissioned artist. <laughs> and wait, wait, so does the, who's the commissioned artist in this case? And what, it's their rights? No, there's no, the commissioned artist is like, do you remember, it, and it mentions it, oh, it's not there. You remember the monkey selfie? Yeah. Right? The animal took the photo, so there's no copyright. Yeah. Right? So they're saying, like, Mid Journey is basically a monkey. It's a monkey. <laughs> right? And so this is the other side that's pushing back. So this is the other side of the argument. So this is Getty Images, who's now, this is part of their legal uh, case. This is in the midst of all this. And it was, has not been dismissed so far. Um, this, is, this is going to proceed. Um, Thousands, nine million images they describe. Like there's nine million images that were scraped to use in training data. But what they have to really concern themselves with is Google and the Authors Guild in 2013, where they ruled that like yeah. scanning a billion books, that's cool, it's transformative, man. We, they made a search tool out of it, <laughs> right? So that's probably where that one's gonna rub around the most, but we'll see. Um, and finally, um, no, let's. That was a comment, let's, let's not do that one. Back to Jerry Saltz and his like kind of lawless thinking and in looking him up again, I ran across this uh, wonderful writer, uh, Haley Naiman, um, from Meme to Culture, uh, Music Assembly, What is Okay to Steal? And she had this, about his rant, it's like, I can't stop thinking about one word that's missing from his rant, power, and this is something that could be a whole talk and should be a whole talk unto itself, is this idea of, you know, 
sure, this freewheeling approach seems cool, but what does it mean to say like, yeah, like everything's free, let's tuck it all, That's, that got us into so much trouble, you know, like 10 years ago. It's like free internet, it's all free, that thinking. I'll stop. Anyway, but thank you very much. <laughs>